This video is brought to you by Brilliant. All right, so let's just start here. Monster Hunter Rise is a very good video game and the PC port is excellent. That is unsurprising on many fronts. There's no such thing as a bad Monster Hunter game. There are some better than others, but few games with this many releases under its masthead have maintained as high a quality bar as Monster Hunter has maintained. Each game will add new core and tertiary systems, will change up structure and progression and campaigns and monster roster and so much more, but no matter how many things change, one thing remains the same. Monster Hunter is always an excellent video game and it is always worth your time. So if you've come to this video wondering if Monster Hunter Rise is somehow bad, then no, that's crazy talk. With that out the way, let's talk about the more interesting side of Monster Hunter Rise, which is that it's a game built for Switch, but ported to PC. This is a game built for a handheld with hardware one and a half generations old, and that has had a vast impact on every aspect of it. Visuals, level design, quality of life features, pacing, difficulty, so much more. We know this because we can compare it to Monster Hunter World, which was released back in 2018 for PS4 and Xbox and was later ported to PC. That was a massive evolution for the franchise in many ways, as it was the first Monster Hunter game in a long time that was designed to be played on a big TV while sitting on a couch and it wasn't limited by Nintendo's perpetually last-gen hardware. That was a truly phenomenal video game. And now along comes Rise, which has the seemingly impossible task of trying to meet or top that while running on hardware less powerful than most modern-day cell phones. In that context, it's pretty incredible what Capcom have managed to do here. Capcom really looked at how to evolve this franchise in the context of the Nintendo Switch handheld console, where the technology is more limited and game sessions are meant to be shorter, and where there's a whole new audience who have never played one of the DS Monster Hunter games and skipped generations on the Switch because it looks pretty old at this point. Capcom knew what they were aiming for here and they really hit their mark. If I was reviewing Monster Hunter Rise for the Switch, I would almost certainly strongly recommend it because it is, hands down, the best version of Monster Hunter on the Switch and one of the best games on the platform full stop. But I'm not reviewing it on the Switch, I'm reviewing it on the PC, where the compromises and changes that Rise makes come under a lot more scrutiny owing to the general expectations of PC gamers and also the fact that you can play Monster Hunter World instead. This is one of those times where I'm low-key glad that this like button is broken because I liked Monster Hunter Rise, but I liked it a lot less than Monster Hunter World. Its technical compromises are minor, but it's hard not to recall the lush density of Monster Hunter World and feel a little short-changed here. It's nice to know that the game is so much more accessible to new players, but I found this game to be really, really easy until I was soloing like seven star group quests. I've always felt a little uncomfortable at how ruthless my culling of monster populations was, but I feel like a downright super villain here as I mercilessly dumpster every monster that dares cross my path with only the most basic, unoptimized gear and without ever really breaking a sweat, often completing hunts in 10 minutes, sometimes less. Much of my issue with the difficulty still stems from the inclusion of the new wire bug mechanic, which, hot take alert, I hate this thing. I think it totally breaks the game. I think it is way too strong by every metric, and once you understand how it works, it trivializes so many mechanics and enemy attacks since you can avoid them, iframe through them, or just immediately recover when you do get hit. There are other things too. Structurally, Rise lacks a feeling of progression as you move through its campaign. The move back to separate solo and group quests and how few solo quests there are, I don't think that's an improvement. The Rampage missions are kind of awkward, and I think we've reached the point with Monster Hunter where there's almost this feeling of system bloat. Like there are just too many things that you and your companions are simultaneously doing while you're in the village, and I don't think any of it makes the game better. Monster Hunter Rise is an objectively excellent video game, but the degree to which I'm able to recommend it to you depends a lot on your relationship to the franchise, to Monster Hunter World, to the Switch version, and to the innovations that Capcom have brought here. Put simply, Rise is faster, more arcadey, more flashy, and more immediately satisfying. And all of those are good things if that's what you're looking for. But I loved World for how slow it was, and how prolonged some of my showdowns were, and how immersive its environments felt, and for the rush I got when I finally, finally felled my mighty foes. I never got the same rush playing Rise, which is why I liked it, but I didn't love it. Some of you have tuned in to find out whether this PC port sucks or not. It definitely does not. 
As I said at the beginning of the video, the PC port is actually excellent. It has all the settings and the options and it runs beautifully and it doesn't crash. I ran this on an RTX 2080 Ti at 4K and I got a locked 60 FPS the entire time, almost no frame drops. RE Engine is some sort of black magic because Capcom got this thing running at a relatively solid 30 FPS on the Switch, which is like... My oven has more processing power than the Switch, and my oven is 10 years old. Seriously though, it would have taken a truly half-assed Square Enix level port to get this running badly on PCs, but in typical form, Capcom cut zero corners, and the result is excellent, at least for me. I hope it's the same on your rig as well. I've definitely seen some commentary that Monster Hunter Rise doesn't look great on PC, and yeah, I, I kind of agree with that, but also... I think we need to keep things in perspective. Like, yeah, it doesn't look as good as a contemporary PC game made for PC or newer consoles, and it doesn't look as good as Monster Hunter World, but it still looks pretty good. I mean, it certainly looks better than Monster Hunter Stories 2, another Switch console exclusive also ported to PC. That game had some really fantastic art design when it came to characters and monsters, but the rest of the game looked really shit. That's not the case here in Rise. From armor, to environments, to character models, to monster designs, it all looks pretty decent-ish. I don't think any part of it will offend your sensibilities unless they're particularly sensitive. Rise is really smart in the way it compensates for the Switch's lack of grunt. It leans into a more stylized and saturated art style than World ever did. If you imagine a sort of spectrum where on one end you have the really cartoonish visuals of Monster Hunter stories, and on the other end you have the more muted, realistic stylings of World, then right in the middle would sit Monster Hunter Rise, a game that wants its characters, companions, gear and monsters to really stand out without ever overdoing it. This is more true to the classic Monster Hunter art style pre-Monster Hunter World, and I have to say I think this is the sweet spot. Despite the lack of detail on characters or monsters, I love seeing how much they would pop against the backdrop of their surroundings. Like I said, Capcom knew what they had to work with. They knew they couldn't make the game look as intricate as World, so they essentially distracted you with this bold use of color. But yeah, if your eye does wander, then it very quickly begins to notice just how bare bones much of the rest of the game is. I mean, if we take just a brief look at some of the environments in World, you can see how detailed it is, how dense it is. You can see the little finishings from foliage to flowing lava to caverns littered with bones and so much more. Smash cut to rise and yeah, there's just nothing there. It's all really flat in terms of color palette, in terms of texture detail. All of those little finishings, they're just not there at all. It's definitely a big step back, that's for sure. To be honest though, this didn't really bother me that much. I definitely thought about it as I played and I would have liked for it to have looked better, but I get it. It's a Switch game ported to PC. Expecting it to look vastly different or better is unrealistic. My bigger concern with the environments is how uninteresting and vanilla they are in the first instance and how they become even less interesting with the inclusion of the wire bug and the little dog thing that you can ride around on. World had a number of interactive environmental elements, many of which were aligned to the bosses you were fighting. When you fought Diabolos, you would do so over a bed of quicksand, which would eventually cave in so that you would both tumble into this cavern below to complete the fight. That was so fucking epic, by the way. There was another section on a map which was dammed up, and if you could lure the monster into ramming it enough, the dam would break and you would be swept down river. Levels in World were not only dynamic, they were also an extension of the boss encounters. None of that exists here in Rise. It's all just very generic fighting space, and enemies won't be able to use any of the terrain to their advantage, which is a design choice from Capcom. It's not a technical one. And I do think that's a big step back. The other thing is that you contend far less with these environments because of the wire bug. So when I played World, I remember thinking that I was kind of pushing through the jungle or the desert or the tundra or the molten fields. I felt like I had to navigate these spaces on their terms because I did. Now I can just kind of jump over them like Spider-Man. I, I really can just kind of ignore topography and obstructions because the wire bug lets me do that. Similarly, the dog thing that I can ride around on, it's nice and it's convenient and it makes a lot of sense on a handheld where you want hunts to be over more quickly, but the flip side is that I lost all sense of scale because I could move through environments too quickly. 
I guess what I'm saying is that separate from anything technical, each environment in world was almost like a boss in itself. You had to fight it and master it. That same relationship doesn't exist here in Rise at all, as your ability to leap over space or move through it at pace never allows you to become more intimate with these environments. While Rise may compromise on its technical aspects and its environment design, it makes absolutely zero compromises in the most essential aspect of Monster Hunter. Kicking monsters' asses and then wearing those asses as hats. That's actually where the term ass hat came from, by the way. It's a Monster Hunter thing. Did you know that? No? Okay, let's just roll the combat montage. So first of all, let me just say that I'm not a Monster Hunter expert because that is definitely a thing. Monster Hunter is an endlessly deep, complex series and proper knowledge of it is like a lifelong vocation. It's like you can become a Shaolin monk or you can become a chess grandmaster or you can be really good at Monster Hunter. All three of those things take roughly the same time commitment. I'm a casual fan. I've dabbled in a few of the DS versions. I played a little bit of Generations on Switch, but I bounced off that really fast because it's pretty dated now. My Monster Hunter game was World, which was a drastic overhauling of the Monster Hunter formula. And many purists say that it was too much of an overhaul, that it streamlined the game too much and sanded back too many of the rough edges that served as handholds for those that fell in love with the games back in the day. It's kind of funny then that even I, as a casual fan, feel like I've reached that same point in Rise where I look at its changes and I think they go too far in how much they've streamlined the game, how much they reduce difficulty, and how much they speed up the overall pace of hunts. Before I dive into that though, I do want to come back to that point I made at the beginning of this review, which is that these changes make sense when you think about what Rise is trying to do and where it's trying to do it. So many of the changes make the title easier, more accessible, which is fantastic for welcoming in newcomers. So many of the changes reduce the time it takes to hunt a monster or the downtime between engagements. That's great if you're on a handheld and you're looking for more immediate transactional style gameplay. So I understand why this stuff is the way that it is. And if I was playing this on the Switch, I'd be like, yeah, cool, this is awesome. But as I play through it on the PC, I'm kind of just thinking a lot about how I'd rather be playing Monster Hunter World. First things first, Monster Hunter is still always among the best melee combat on the market today. It's crazy how good it feels to fight things in this game. The weight and the feedback of the weapons, the accuracy of the hitboxes, the combos and the movesets and mechanics of each weapon. There are 14 weapons in Monster Hunter Rise and each one of them is deep enough to be the main and only weapon in a standalone non-Monster Hunter game. The scope of its combat system is truly staggering and it would never have been possible as a brand new thing just built from scratch because it, there's just too much here. Instead, Monster Hunter arrived here slowly, incrementally, with each new game expanding both the roster of weapons and the capability of those weapons, while always continuing to refine the core, underlying fundamentals of the melee combat. I mean, Capcom have been doing this for nearly two decades now, so when you pick up Monster Hunter Rise, you're picking up something that has been refined and perfected over a nearly 20 year period. It's so good, and if you haven't played a Monster Hunter game before, then Rise will showcase for you the strength of its combat just as well as any other Monster Hunter game will. That baseline quality meant that I certainly enjoyed myself as I played, even while I wasn't enjoying many of the changes that Rise brings. The biggest innovation is, of course, the wire bug. It's essentially a grapple with at least two charges, both of which are on a really short cooldown. Now, there's an old adage that there's no video game that cannot be improved by adding a grapple to it. I think Monster Hunter Rise is the very first video game to disprove that assertion. Again, I should probably offer a disclaimer here. Most people love this thing. In fact, as I've watched other reviews for Rise, the most celebrated feature of this entire game has been the wire bug. And, you know, to its credit, it's fun. It's zippy and it's aerial and it's acrobatic. And it's this very immediate twitchy part of your arsenal where many weapons in Monster Hunter are deliberately very slow and very grounded and very clunky. But that's kind of a double-edged sword, right? No pun intended. See, I mained Insect Glaive in Monster Hunter games prior because the versatility and the verticality of that weapon, they were unmatched by anything else on the roster. 
Now everyone is operating vertically all the time, no matter what they're using, which means that the identity of the insect glaive is greatly diminished, such that I actually dropped it and ran switch axe here instead. Similarly, the overall pace of weapons is transformed, and I don't think in a good way. Now almost every weapon is much faster to use because the wire bug grapple and the silk bind attacks negate a lot of the movement penalties inherent in each weapon type. They also can negate entire weapon mechanics. So the switch axe, for example, typically needs to be manually reloaded at times and charged up by using it in axe mode. Well, not so much when you have a wire bug charge because you have an ability that will dash you forward a significant distance while instantly reloading your switch axe while also giving it a significant amount of charge and making it so that sword attacks do not drain your gauge for a few seconds. This single mechanic essentially allows you to completely ignore all of the resource management inherent in this weapon's core design. Similarly, there's another Silkbind attack I have which lunges me forward, does pretty solid damage, it's stuffed with iframes so I can just ignore a whole bunch of damage, and it makes me immune to any interrupts or knockbacks. That's just a spammable ability I can use basically whenever I like to either engage or evade, or negate damage when I know a big monster attack is coming, or negate status effects entirely. That's a lot for one ability, right? The worst defender though is the wire bug recovery, which as I said, flat out should not be in this game. Anytime you get knocked up or back or down, you can press the wire bug button and a direction and you will immediately grapple over there and you will instantly sheath your weapon and land on your feet. Now, if you haven't played Monster Hunter before, that sheathing thing probably doesn't sound like a big deal. But trust me, that is a very, very big deal. A huge part of Monster Hunter is managing the sheathing and unsheathing of your weapon since you can't use items with a weapon out and your mobility is greatly reduced. With Wirebug Recovery, I can always dodge out of the way of any monster follow-up attack and I will land on my feet and I can immediately start sprinting or I can just Wirebug again and then I can chug a potion while I'm doing all of this. So yes, the Wirebug is flashy and fun, but the net impact of its inclusion is that it really trivialized most encounters. I really had to study and memorize monster attack patterns in World because the penalties for getting stuff wrong was so severe. From the first hit to the follow-up hit to the daze, you really had to stay on your toes and you really had to pay attention. Here, I just never had to think in those terms because I was so able to avoid, mitigate or recover from damage that I didn't fear these monsters. I, I really didn't. And that includes the times when I was soloing high rank group quests because I had no one to play with during the review period. When I think back to Monster Hunter World, the feeling I recall most vividly is how powerful these monsters were and how weak and vulnerable I was. I really did feel like this tiny little insect buzzing around them and if they landed one good swat on me I was done for. Here in Rise, I feel like I'm the monster. When I see new prey, I kind of pity it because I'm like, ah, uh, poor little Diabolos, he's about to get reamed by my good friend, the Wirebug. For real, I just had no fear and while Rise is still able to serve up fun and thrills and spectacle, I don't think Monster Hunter is Monster Hunter unless you're afraid of what you're fighting and I definitely wasn't here. It would be very easy to advance the argument that Monster Hunter games are always basically the same since the core gameplay is always the same and the monster roster is pretty consistent, as is the weapon roster, as is the general flow of the campaign and the end game, etc, etc. So yeah, you could argue that, but no one does. And the reason for that is that while Capcom protect and maintain the essential elements of the Monster Hunter experience, they never rest on their laurels and they are relentless in the way they innovate around that core experience. Some of that innovation kind of sucks, like the Zora Magdaros fights in Monster Hunter World. These were easily the worst part of any Monster Hunter game I'd ever played. They were truly awful. Sometimes that innovation is pretty good, but it's a little awkward, such as in the case of these Rampage quests. Now, these are a strange hybrid of tower defense and monster hunting. You and your buddies are able to set up both automated and manned defenses around a small area, and the intention is to hold out against waves of monsters as they try to make their way into the village. Most of the time, you're going to be manning a turret, but sometimes a gong is rung 
along, which massively increases your damage dealt, allowing you to get down and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with your foes and melt them pretty quickly. There's lots of unique, interesting mechanics at work here, like different structures to build and traps to lay down, and you get access to more options as you progress through more waves, and you can summon companion heroes from the village to help you out, and later on you'll fight Apex monsters, which is nice. But yeah, it still feels like Capcom are reaching for or searching for some epic, unique experience that equals the glory of the hunts, and they still haven't found it yet. Rampage missions are few, but even then, I still groaned a little when I had to do them. To be fair, they are very much built for co-op play, and I was soloing them since I didn't have anyone to play with during the review, so that meant I was gonna have at least a little bit of a bad time. But even if I was doing this with other people, I can't see how I wouldn't rather be doing a regular hunt instead. So relentless is Capcom's urge to innovate around the core of the franchise that some of the innovation feels quite unnecessary. It's crazy just how many information pop-ups you get when you start playing this game. Two or three hours deep, I was still regularly getting spammed with new pop-ups explaining new systems to me. And that interruption might sting less if I felt like those systems were adding anything, but I don't think they are. I now need to craft not only my own armor and weapons, not only armor and weapons for my Palico, but also armor and weapons for my Palamute dog companion thing. And there's a whole gear system for each of them, which I don't really understand because even with all of the pop-ups, the gear system for your pets is never really explained to you. Then there's the crafting of charms, which seems to be this random thing where you sort of roll a dice and then you come back a few hunts later to see what you've got. Then there's the companion recruitment thing where you're recruiting an army of cats and dogs and training them in dojos and sending them out on hunts and putting one of them in a submarine so they can gather materials for you. Then there's this lady who sells you stuff, but it rotates and I've never seen her sell anything good. There's just so much, right? And obviously you can ignore a lot of these systems, but utilizing them does provide you with materials and things that are useful to you. But having to keep track of all this stuff at once, it's a lot. Every trip back to the village felt like I was doing my monthly bookkeeping, like checking in with this person and then that person and spending some points on this thing and upgrading that piece of dog loot and then sending this cat out in the submarine so he can gather me some honey. Like, none of this was awful, but I don't think it's adding anything either. You could kind of delete all of this and the only thing that would really be lost is that feeling of lost opportunity that you get when you don't regularly engage all of these systems. This sort of guilt where you're like, ugh, I guess I should go check in on the dojo to see if my pets are high enough level to start killing monsters without me. I guess I should go and check in on the submarine cat to see what he's got for me. Like, not doing that stuff, as I said, makes you feel like you're not playing the game properly. It's obviously a minor gripe, but I just don't like that feeling. I don't like thinking that I'm leaving anything on the table, and because there's so much admin to be done in the village, I just had that feeling more often than I would have liked. Often at the end of a review, I use my conclusion to say one or two things that I haven't yet said, but to be honest with you, I feel like I've really said everything I have to say on this one, but I do want to come back to that central message that I've tried to reiterate throughout this whole video, which is that this is a great game, but more than almost any other game I think I've ever reviewed, I'm reminded how much influence a platform can have on the way we view and contextualize a game. I remember reviewing the Diablo 3 port for the Switch, and I was like, damn, this is a fucking good port. Like, they really nailed that one, and even though I had already had my fill of Diablo 3, it was such a genuine pleasure to play through it again on a portable handheld, and the platform makes you think about the game differently, you think about what it's like to play it on the go, you compare it to other ARPGs on that platform, you think about how the graphical downgrading and resolution affects the overall experience, and you think about the impact of design choices like the offline mode, or the ability to play local co-op using a single set of Joy-Cons. That's pretty cool, by the way. Platforms dictate the game design and technical choices that developers make, and you really feel that here in Rise, not just in graphical downgrading, but in decisions around difficulty and pacing and traversal. Obviously, this is far from the first handheld Monster Hunter game. The franchise was essentially a handheld franchise for a number of years, and back then the game was a hell of a lot more grueling and demanding than it is now. 
Capcom's overall design philosophy for this franchise has evolved a lot with World, and it evolves even more here with Rise. Hell, there's no hunting of monsters here. As soon as you load into a map, the location of all monsters is immediately revealed to you on the minimap. That's a design choice that gets you into combat faster, which makes a lot of sense when you're playing on a handheld where game sessions are often shorter. But I really liked the hunting part of Monster Hunter. I liked having no idea where they were and just having to look around. And I liked the scout fly system in World that gave me some clues at least. I liked hunts that would take 30 minutes, maybe more if I was running out of supplies and had to scavenge a bunch to keep going. I liked that one small mistake could see me carted. Hell, I like getting triple carted and thinking, okay, wow, how the fuck am I going to kill this thing? Rise certainly delivers for the platform it was built for, but I think on the PC, where World is this shadow looming over it, I think it falls short, and rather than spend more time with Rise, I'm probably going to go back and play more Monster Hunter World instead. For now at least, I'll certainly keep an open mind for the Sunbreak expansion in the summer, and I'll see where Capcom are planning to take things next. Okay, so here's something interesting. If you are like me, then you did not pay attention in school during science and mathematics. I mean, when you're 14 years old, that stuff's just boring, right? Well, now I'm doing YouTube searches like relativity for dummies. Because if it wasn't explained to me like I was four years old, then my eyes would just glaze over in the first six seconds. Brilliant is my shot at dropping the for dummies suffix for good. Brilliant is a unique platform that offers a huge range of courses ranging from beginner level to advanced study. Each of the courses clearly explains scientific, mathematic and computer programming concepts and provides interactive elements so you're always learning by doing. Like for example, ever wonder how a computer actually works? Well, there's a course for that here. Courses are broken up into manageable sections so that you don't have to do them all at once, you can break them up into a few sittings. You can also do them on mobile since they have a dedicated app that has a 4.6 rating with over 70,000 reviews on the Android store alone. If you're anything like me, then Brilliant is your catch-up shortcut to all the stuff you probably missed in school or that you just weren't interested in back then. It's also a chance to sharpen your mind by learning entirely new things in the world of science, mathematics and technology, stuff that you didn't even know existed. To learn more, visit brilliant.org forward slash skill up and as a special offer, the first 200 people to sign up get 20% off the annual premium subscription price. Thanks Brilliant for sponsoring the video and thank you for watching it.